Hi, this is Shira Rubinoff. Welcome to Insights in Tech. I'm here with Anne. Anne, please introduce yourself to our audience. Tell them who you are and what you've done in the past and what you're currently doing. Sure. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, Anne Johnson. I'm at Microsoft. I lead our cybersecurity business globally. I've been doing uh, cybersecurity for 20 years, spent about 14 years at RSA Security, then a few other companies before I came to Microsoft four and a half years ago. And I'm just really excited and passionate about cybersecurity. And it's such a world we're living in right now where we're going to have the opportunity to have such a big impact with how people work and productivity. So it's a great time to be here. Certainly. So, and this pandemic of COVID-19 has really shaken up the world in many different ways, certainly in a personal way, as well as from a business perspective. So, Anne, can you please share with us how COVID-19 has impacted your organization from both a company and employee perspective? Sure. So we actually have been published some uh, information about how Microsoft handled COVID-19. I think the one advantage for us and for our employees is that we were already equipped to go home, right? We had already had a split tunnel environment for our folks to access the productivity tools we use um, remotely. Our, we, we issue laptops so people had their devices um, and we were well equipped for our remote workforce to go home and we went home. We went home very quickly. Um, and have been working from home since then. And we had to think about how we put new tools in the sock and how we thought about threats and as we saw new COVID lures. But from a, from a work standpoint, we found that Microsoft was a little more advantaged even than some of our customers because we had the technology ready to go. And we had started implementing a zero trust architecture and we were, we were well down that path. So as we've worked with our customers, we've had to actually get them to the place where they were able to, whether an employee is on our, their own device or whether they're on a work device, be able to be secure, but yet be productive and access all the resources that they need to do their job. Wonderful. So you certainly were ahead of the game. So that's super important and kudos to Microsoft. And Anna, has there been any challenges you did not expect from your workforce becoming a mostly remote work situation? Certainly you were ahead of the curve, but were there any unexpected things that happened? I think the biggest opportunity for us was the developers. They're used to work on multiple devices, right, at, at any given point in time. And we had to very quickly ramp up the um, Windows virtual desktop environment for them because they may have only gone home with, you know, one computer or maybe they had two computers. And we had to both enable them with um, like bigger monitors so multiple bigger monitors in their home office environments, but also with those virtual environments so they can flip back and forth between the different machines. That was probably our biggest learning is that anyone that needs that kind of compute power, it was just a little bit more challenging to make them productive yet keep them secure. Well, that certainly sounds like a challenge, but I'm sure you've risen to the occasion there and uh, certainly a lot of other ones, but being ahead of the curve, you certainly did not have to deal with them, which is wonderful. So now that we've started to move to stage two and in some cases, stage three of companies opening up to both remote and in-person environment, what new challenges do you see organizations facing from a cybersecurity perspective that may, they may not have expected? I think there's a couple things. I think that your SOC, you know, the Security Operations Center, has to think a little differently because we, we're calling it a hybrid security world. You're going to have folks that are working remotely and you're going to have folks that are back in the office. You're going to have this hybrid environment. So how you look at threats and how you monitor threats and how you think about folks that are literally inside, you know, your corporate firewall, for example, versus those that are outside. We're also seeing an increase in insider risk and insider threat from our customers because in these uncertain times, there's a lot of environments where people are just so unstable. They're very concerned about their insider risk. And when you think about layoffs and all the impacts that we've had, customers are really ramping up and thinking about their monitoring of that insider threat, again, with employees both in a remote environment and someone back in the office environment. And how do you monitor them and do you do things differently, right? Sure. So what kind of pointers can you give to organizations that are struggling with just that? Yeah, a, a couple things. Number one, I, I think having a really good um, policy around information protection is the first thing, right? Understanding your data, classifying your data, labeling your data, applying the right DLP type controls, whether it's in the cloud or on the endpoint, so that you know where the data is going. Because at the end of the day, typically if someone breaks into your environment or if you have an insider risk, it has to do with some kind of data you have in the environment. Um, the second thing we always talk about and we're going to continue to talk about is multi-factor authentication. You know, we, we know that multi-factor authentication um, helps prevent 99% of credential theft and that's incredibly important right now. And the other thing that, you know, we've been saying and I've been saying is that um, 
most companies are on a zero trust journey, whether they know it or not. So that ability to have that flexible zero trust environment where you're literally interrogating every network attempt or every access attempt, interrogating the session, so you can keep monitoring of the employee and the session, the data, the identity, all of it's very holistic. And the final thing is having a really robust, you know, insider threat management posture and, and environment that you've built and developed. And most of our customers have some, some type of controls around that. That's great. And what would you say to employees themselves if they are worried about this move, you know, from remote to in-person, juggling with what they finally became used to for the last three and a half months? What can they do personally to protect themselves and not fall prey to maybe a phishing attack or, um, as you mentioned, different types of attacks that, that, that happened, not just when you're remote, but on a personal level? Um, the main thing I've said to people is pause. When you get that email, when you get that, I'm getting emails, I'm getting texts, by the way, I'm getting the phone calls, right? I'm getting the whole gamut of type of uh, attempted intrusions or credential theft into my you know, environment. Um, and pause. You need to look at the phishing attack. You need to listen to the voicemail, the SMS before you reply. You also need to make certain that on your personal accounts, you've enabled strong authentication, whether it's, you know, a biometric um, device or even there are some there are some reasons that SMS is not great, but it's still better than a password. Right. Or using an authenticator, right, like the Azure authenticator, but enable even on your personal accounts, something that's stronger than a username and password. Pause, think about what you're doing. And the final thing I would say is if you get a email or a, a phone call or an SMS that you know says it's from your financial institution, don't respond to it. Go and contact them via the normal channel that you would contact them. So the phone number that's printed on the back of your credit card, the phone number that's printed on the website, whatever it is, but use the normal channels. Um, do not reply to an email or to a text or to a phone call. Use your normal channels and then report the phishing attack if it was a phishing attack. I'll give you one quick example. I had a really sophisticated phishing attack um, from a financial services provider, you know, what not from them, but you know, a phishing attempt to get my credentials. And it was an attack, it looked great. I posted on Twitter because it talked about, hey, you need to set up your multi-factor authentication for this account. And it looks so real. And we, when we start talking about enhanced security, it, it checked all the boxes. Also the sense of urgency. Hey, we're gonna turn off your account if you don't do this now. That is that is the sign of a fish, by the way. They're trying to get you to do something urgently without taking that pause. And that's why the first thing I tell people is just to pause. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. It certainly plays on the human factors of something that they panic about. Let's fix it quickly. Let's jump to this or else something will happen. But exactly as you said, stop and pause. And a lot of these things would be curtailed. So I completely agree with you on that. And Anne, when it comes to the future of work, do you believe that because of COVID, we are now moving at a faster pace of transformation? And if so, why? We are, you know, Sadia uh, Nadella, our CEO, said we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months. Yeah. And the reason for that is that organizations had to transform to maintain productivity. Um, so in order to maintain productivity, they had to allow people to work from home. And they're taking those learnings and continuing. They're not just stopping now. They're not saying, okay, we did this at this point in time. All those systems they put in place, they're continuing with so they can be more agile, more flexible. And we like to talk a lot about digital empathy, being empathetic to that end user experience by creating experience where end users can be productive, and secure and really creating an inclusive experience is part of all of that digital transformation. And I think you'll see cybersecurity showing a lot of leadership there with that digital empathy because not all of your end users are went home. Most of them aren't cybersecurity professionals. So how do you make certain they're productive and not punish them for making mistakes? So we're seeing all of those behaviors continue with our customers. Excellent. Any last pointers you want to share with our audience? I think the most important thing I, I would say right now is that, you know, it, it's an unprecedented and unique time for everyone. So what I would say to um, both companies, but, but to employees and even, you know, people in their personal lives is just cut yourself a little bit of slack because you're trying to maybe educate your children, you're maybe you don't have childcare, uh, maybe you have a sick family member, an elderly family member, whatever it is, and you're trying to work and be productive. So just take, you know, give yourself that room and that space, um, be empathetic to yourself, not just um, asking your employers to be empathetic to you. Words of wisdom. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much for joining us here on Insights in Tech today. Thank you.